know how many years that we have been uh, working together to make sure that students complete their FAFSA, but it's always a pleasure to work with Fountain Blue High School uh, seniors and parents. Now we're here tonight to have a conversation about um, the financial aid process. And if everyone will go ahead and make sure that you're muted so well, we don't have any um, interruptions, that would be great. I do wanna also mention that uh, this session is sponsored by Leela. Louisiana's nonprofit resource for FAFSA completion and college access. Uh, we've been in the business for uh, over 20 years, and we do have a lot of answers to questions that you might have. If we don't, we will find out, find someone who does. So um, with that being said, we want to talk a little bit about the costs of college. We all know that it can be expensive. So we wanna make sure that you are um, aware of those expenses. Now you need to expect to pay for your equipment, books and supplies like textbooks, notebooks, a computer if you need one when you go away to school. Your personal expenses like money to pay your phone bill, to do your laundry if you're living away from home, fuel for your car and any food purchases that you might um, incur. Room and board, which can be a big chunk, and this could include your dorm if you're staying on campus, or an apartment if you're staying away from home. And then tuition and fees. Now, most colleges will post their tuition cost on their website, so as you're doing your college searches, you want to make sure you're getting a good idea of what you can expect to pay in tuition, but also you need to be aware that there are Plenty of fees that are going to be assessed, like parking, library, technology, and athletic fees. Um, so this is all going to uh, have to be taken into consideration. But the good news is that financial aid is available from a variety of uh, sources. The U.S. Department of Education, the state of Louisiana, your college or career school, and nonprofit and private organizations. Oh, that's good. Been there here. are three types of student financial aid, free money, which will include grants and scholarships, borrowed money, like student loans, and then, of course, earned money. And that can come from federal work study. Jesus, this is a long time. The types of federal student aid include the federal Pell Grant, the Federal Supplemental Education Opportunity Grant, the Teacher Educational Assistance for College and Higher Education, or TEACH grant, oh, the Iraq and Afghanistan Service Grant, and then direct subsidized, unsubsidized, and PLUS loans. Okay, just muting some people. Now, the Federal Work Study Program provides part-time jobs to help students pay for their education expenses. So when a student answers yes on the FAFSA to federal work study, the financial aid office will consider the student for available jobs on their campus. Then the earnings from these jobs will be paid directly to the student and can be used and should be used to pay for college expenses. I do wanna tell you that these jobs look great on a student's first professional resume. So if you're going to a four-year college and you accept a work-study position, maybe it's in the chancellor's office. That is four years of professional work history to report. Now, if you can't complete your college degree without student loans, then they are a good investment, but it's important to remember to only borrow what you need to complete your education. Um, and it's also important to understand the different types of loans that you might be offered. Direct subsidized loans are based on financial need and no interest is charged until you graduate and cease to attend. These are known as need-based loans. On the other hand, almost everyone is eligible for the direct unsubsidized loans regardless of your financial need. However, with this type of loan, interest does begin to accrue once they're fully dispersed. 
which is usually in the spring of each academic year. And then of course, interest does continue to accrue throughout the life of the loan. So you can see that there is a big difference between direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans. And you can remember this when you receive your student financial aid offer by telling yourself that the you and unsubsidized means that you always pay the interest. So make sure you are accepting the subsidized loan portion first. If you do make the decision to accept loans, always accept the federal student loans first because payments aren't due until you graduate or cease to attend. The interest rate is fixed at a lower rate and no credit check is required. Federal student loans are in the student's name only. On the other hand, private loans um, should be accepted cautiously because some Lenders are going to ask that the student began making payments while he's still in school. The interest rate might be variable and often it's higher and they almost always require a co-signer. So students and families need to do their research before selecting a private loan lender. Student financial aid can be used at four year public and private colleges, community colleges, career and technical schools, for part-time classes and to take online college courses. And all federal student aid and most institutional and private aid is contingent upon completion of the free application for federal student aid or FAFSA. Now, you all know that it launched on October 1st and it does so every academic year. Uh, remember that student financial aid is awarded on a first come first served basis and that's why we all want to make sure that you complete your FAFSA as soon as possible. Remember to pay close attention to your FAFSA deadlines. You're going to have uh, priority financial aid deadlines uh, set forth by each of the colleges you're applying to. Uh, the top scholarship um, is um, will have a FAFSA deadline as well. And yes, the FAFSA can be used as your TOPS application. Uh, federal student aid has a deadline to submit the FAFSA. And then your counselor, Ms. Mathern, may also have a deadline for you to meet your graduation requirement. To be eligible for federal student aid and complete a FAFSA, the student must be one of the following a U.S. citizen or a U.S. national, or have a green card or an arrival departure record, or have battered immigrant, immigrant status or have a T visa. Now let's say the student does have one of the following, they, but their parents do not. That's fine, the student can still submit a FAFSA, but anywhere a parent's social security number is requested, they will enter zeros in that field. Now remember, only um, students and parents who have um, a social security card can create a federal student aid ID and electronically sign the FAFSA. All others must print a signature page and mail into the Department of Education. To begin the FAFSA process, it's really important that you collect all of the documents that you're gonna to need to complete the form. And by doing this, it really should take no longer than 30 to 45 minutes to complete and submit your FAFSA. Those documents include the student and parent's social security cards, because you must report your name and number exactly as it's printed on your most recent card. The student and parent's 2020 federal income tax returns, if you filed one. And if you don't have a copy in hand, now is the time to contact your tax preparer and request a duplicate. Um, it is important to have this form with you, and I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. The student and parents should gather their 2020 W-2s because there's information on this form that might not be found on your federal tax return. And then bank statements and records of investments because you must report the balances of these accounts as of the date you submit your FAFSA. 
first you want to create your federal student aid ID because this is going to allow students and parents with social security numbers to identify themselves electronically when accessing the FAFSA. The FSA ID will consist of a unique username and a password that you create with your personal information. So each student and one of his parents should provide his personal information on his ID um, to be able to electronically sign the FAFSA. Now remember, you don't want any shared information. So students don't use mom or dad's mobile or email address, only use your own information and use your personal email account. Because if you use your school email address, Federal student aid is not going to have any way to get in touch with you later on in the summer when they need um, to provide you with some additional information. So use your personal email. Parents use your personal email. Don't use a business account. Sometimes uh, communications from federal student aid will be lost in your spam folders. Now your username and password known as the FSA ID is your electronic signature and it's legally binding. So make sure you're recording it because you're gonna need it every year that you complete your FAFSA, but keep it in a very secure place. If you don't have access to a computer when you're ready to get started, you can always download the FAFSA mobile app. It's called My Student Aid and it's easy to use to submit your FAFSA either on your mobile phone or any other mobile device with internet access. Or if you prefer, you can complete the FAFSA using the web-based version at fafsa.gov. Now, say the student prefers to use the app, that's fine. Mom and dad prefer the mobile of the um, web-based version. You can work independent, uh, independently because when it's time to sign and submit, all the information is going to be integrated into one form. You want to enter the FAFSA, of course, with your username and password. You will be asked to identify your role. Now, if you're the parent and you have permission to complete the entire FAFSA for your student, it is a bit easier if you enter stating, I am the student and want to access the FAFSA form. That way you can see the entire form, but make sure it's okay with your student. You'll begin the FAFSA by logging in with the student's FSA ID, username and password, because the FAFSA is the student's application for federal student aid. The parent ID is gonna be used later in the form if you choose to transfer your tax information from the IRS and drop it into the FAFSA and then again to sign the student's FAFSA. The high school class of 2022 should complete the 2022-2023 FAFSA because that's the academic year that you're applying for financial aid. You're gonna see two options and it's not uncommon that a student will begin the 21-22 FAFSA. But if he does so, the schools are going to think that he is in college this academic year. And also Louisiana high school uh, seniors um, in the public school system must complete the 22-23 FAFSA to meet that graduation requirement. On this page, you'll also be able to see your FSA ID status and you can tell um, at this time, if all your information has been verified with Social Security uh, Administration, and then you can continue on through the form. On the next um, screen, you will be asked to create a save key. Now, this is a short series of letters and or numbers, and it serves as an additional layer of security. If you don't complete the FAFSA in one sitting, you will be asked to provide your save key to re-enter. So you're writing down your username and password, be sure and write down your save key as well. You're in the FAFSA. You can see here that there are seven sections that need to be completed before you can submit. And the information that you used to create your student and parent FSA ID must match exactly what is entered in the FAFSA or you're gonna have trouble signing it. 
So this means that the name, social, date of birth, email address, home address, phone number needs to be exactly what, is, what you entered in your FSA ID. These sections are going to include the student demographics where the student will be asked to provide his social security number, name, date of birth, email, home address, residency status, and gender. The school selection section where you will name your high school and the colleges that you want your FAFSA data to be sent to. Then you'll be asked to um, state your housing plans on each of those camp campuses. Next is the dependency status section where students will be asked to consider a list of questions that are, determined, that are gonna be used to determine whether he is dependent or independent for FAFSA purposes. He'll be asked the number of dependents living in his household and his parents' education completion level to determine whether he's a first generation college student. Next, you'll move to the parent demographic section where parents will report their social security numbers, their names, marital status, their, and their email addresses. And then the parent financial section. Now in this section, a, the parent or parents will report their working wages from 2020, any federal benefits they receive and the balances of their savings and investment accounts. Then you'll move on into the student financials where the student will be asked the very same questions. So occasionally this is a hang up for um, students and parents because the sections look exactly alike. They're asking the exact same information. So always look on the page you're working on. On this page, you can see it says student information. So this is the student filing, tax filing status. Once you get through this section, it's almost time to sign and submit. And once you do, you're going to see the FAFSA summary page. Now, it's important that you review this summary because this is your chance to make any corrections that you need to make before you submit the FAFSA. So look it over. And if you do see that something needs to be changed, just click on that question and it will take you back to that section and you can make that correction. Once you're sure that you're ready to submit, you will be taken to the sign and submit section where the student and one parent, that parent that created the FSA ID, will use that ID to sign the student's FAFSA. If you submit your FAFSA without these signatures, uh, the FAFSA will be processed, but it will be put on hold until you go back into the form, sign and resubmit it. Now remember, if you've listed two parents in your FAFSA, the one who created that FSA ID is the one who needs to sign your FAFSA. And remember uh, to jot down which parent is parent one and which parent is parent two. That's how you will determine um, which parent will sign your FAFSA. Now, as you're moving through the FAFSA, if you have a question, you can always click on the question mark beside it. You're gonna see one beside every single FAFSA question and you'll get a more detailed description of what they expect you to enter in that field. You can use the hyperlinks that are provided to give uh, more information about maybe some financial aid or legal terms that you've not heard of before. If you'd like to uh, request a FAFSA online chat, or call federal student aid, they will be happy to help you through the process. But if you wanna to speak to me directly, you can call Leela's FAFSA helpline and I'll leave that for you at the end of the presentation. I wanna to mention to you that only the colleges that you list on the FAFSA in that school selection section are going to consider you for student financial aid. So you want to add all of the schools that you're considering. Even if you haven't uh, been accepted to those schools yet, 
maybe you haven't even applied to them, go ahead and add them to your FAFSA so you don't have to go back later and add those schools. But it is important to go ahead and um, get those college applications completed because a lot of times the financial aid will not consider you for aid until they receive word from the admissions office that you've been ex uh, accepted. Now you can apply to, uh, if you're planning to apply to more than 10 colleges, um, you can only add 10 on your FAFSA at a time. If you're planning to apply to more than 10, there are instructions here on how to do so. Or if you wanna speak to me directly about that, I'll be happy to help you through. Now to determine whether the student is a dependent or an independent student, for FAFSA purposes. He's gonna be asked to consider these statements. Will you, the student, be 24 or older by January 1st of the school year for which you're applying for financial aid? Are you married or separated but not divorced? Will you be working on a graduate degree during the academic year in which you're applying for aid? Do you have children or other dependents other than children or a spouse who receive more than half of their support from you, the student? Are you currently serving on active duty in the US Armed Forces for purposes other than training? Are you a veteran of the US Armed Forces? At any time since you turned 13, were both of your parents deceased? Were you in foster care? or were you a ward or a dependent of the court? Are you an emancipated minor or were you in legal guardianship as determined by a court? And um, it's important to um, note that legal custody is not always considered legal guardianship. So make sure that you have your documentation with you as you're answering these questions. Are you an unaccompanied youth who's homeless or are you self-supporting and at risk of being homeless? If you do find yourself in this situation, please ask your school district to provide you with a copy of that documentation because the financial aid office will ask you for it. Now, if you can answer yes to just one of these questions and provide a legal document supporting your claim, then you're considered an independent student for FAFSA purposes, and you will not be required to provide parental information. Everyone else will be. Even those students who might live with their grandparents or other relatives or perhaps friends or neighbors who are not your legal guardians and who have not legally adopted you, these students will still need information from their biological parents, which are still considered their legal parents. So say you um, live with one of these people, I say it's a grandparent and uh, they're your legal guardians. Well, then that's easy. You are automatically considered an independent student because of your legal guardian status and you will not have to provide any adults information on your FAFSA. And let's say one of these people you're living with has legally adopted you, then those are now your legal parents and they will be listed on your FAFSA, not your biological parents. And this can be confusing. So if you want to talk to me as you're going through your FAFSA and you get to these questions, I'm happy to work with you independently. Also for FAFSA purposes, you're not considered an independent student just because you might file your own taxes or say you choose to live alone and you support yourself, you still must provide information about your legal parents. And then the most commonly asked question that we receive is, which parent or parents should I list on my FAFSA? The rule of thumb is that the parent or parents that you've lived with the longest in the past 12 months should be listed on your FAFSA. Now, we often get questions. Well, I've lived with my mom um, the past 12 months, but my dad claims me on his income tax return. 
you're listing your mom. It makes no difference who um, claims you on their tax returns. It could be an aunt, it could be someone else um, in the family. You still must provide information about the parent that you lived with the longest in the past 12 months. So if you live with both of your biological parents, that's easy, you're gonna list both of them. But if the parent you lived with the longest in the past 12 months is either separated, divorced, or was never married, you should list just that legal parent on the FAFSA, unless that parent is remarried, then you must include that step parent because federal student aid wants to know the financial standing of the household that the student has lived in the longest in the 12 months prior to the date that the FAFSA was submitted. Now, if you're identified as a dependent student, say you couldn't answer yes to one of the prior a dependency status questions, but your parents refuse to provide their information on your FAFSA, you can submit it by stating, I'm unable to provide information about my parents. Uh, that will skip you over the parent section. But remember, these students are only going to be considered for unsubsidized federal student loans. They will not even be considered for any of the grants or free money available. So if you find yourself in this situation, please go ahead and submit your FAFSA, but contact the financial aid offices at the colleges you're applying to and let them know about your situation. They will put you in an appeal process while they attempt to work with your parents to provide their information. If they still will not, they might be able to find some additional money to help you make it through that academic year. But it's always best to um, encourage your parents to assist. Now, to expedite the processing of your federal student aid, it's encouraged that the student and parents use the Internal Revenue Services data retrieval tool to provide income information if they filed a 2020 federal income tax return. Using this tool is gonna to greatly diminish the student's chances of being selected for verification by his college financial aid office. If you do choose to use the IRS data retrieval tool, you're going to select proceed to the IRS. And once you're in the portal, you wanna grab that 2020 federal income tax return and enter your name and address exactly as it's printed there. Even if your name was misspelled by the tax preparer or say you've even moved since that time, the IRS wants to know that the person who's in their system is the person that filed that tax return. Now, once you do submit your FAFSA, you're going to receive a FAFSA confirmation pop-up. Please print this page or take a screenshot of this page because there's information here that you might not uh, be able to find at any other time. The student will receive a confirmation email. You know, the email that Ms. Mathern asked that you forward to her uh, stating that you submitted the FAFSA but it's not going to show all this information. It's not going to show the next steps you need to take to complete the process. It's not going to show the list of colleges that are going to receive your data. On this page, you'll be able to see the estimated expected family contribution and the date and time that you submitted the FAFSA. We will hear from students that say, um, LSU said they didn't get my FAFSA. Then you call LSU and give them that confirmation number and date and time, that's date stamped. You can also provide your colleges with the data release number. And by doing this, they can make FAFSA changes that they request that you make. So you don't have to go back into your FAFSA, make the changes, sign and submit, wait for it to be processed again. Uh, they can do that for you with that number. Once your FAFSA is fully processed, which usually takes three to five days, it's then shared with your colleges and they will begin to identify any aid that you might be eligible to receive. 
Now, if you want to add a school or change your contact info, or as I mentioned, maybe make some changes that your college requested, simply log back into the FAFSA, make those changes. But remember, you should sign and submit the FAFSA each time. And if your family's financial situation has changed since 2020, and we know that there's a lot of this happening around the country, but specifically in Louisiana with our history of um, tropical storms and other disasters, contact your college financial aid offices because they have the ability to adjust your aid by using their own professional judgment. So if someone in the family has lost a job or has a reduction in work hours, or maybe you've had some unexpected medical expenses um, that you've incurred, let the financial aid office know. This is what they do for a living. And just like Ms. Mathurin, they're there to help you. So don't be shy about asking them for some assistance. Because they're trying to determine the student's net price. And they're going to do this by subtracting any grants and scholarships that they can find for the student. And they're going to subtract that from the cost of attendance at their school. Now, the student is responsible for that net price. And you can either pay that in cash or accept student loans to pay that balance. The student's going to receive a financial aid offer from each of the schools listed on the FAFSA. And that will show the college's cost of attendance and line item any grants, scholarships, work study, and student loans that they can offer you to go to their college. So read over these carefully and respond to any requests for additional information. Now, as I mentioned, many colleges are going to wait until the student has been accepted. So finish up those college applications as well. When you do determine which college you're going to, you want to accept your financial aid in this order. Scholarships and grants, because this is gift money that doesn't have to be repaid. Federal work study is earned money that you don't have to pay back. And then last, a resort would be student loans, because this is borrowed money and you must repay it with interest. Scholarships are gifts that don't have to be repaid, so now is the time to start or continue your search. They're offered by colleges, employers, private and nonprofit groups, community, religious, and social organizations, just to name a few. Some are going to be merit-based, awarded on academic achievement. Others are based on financial need. But applying and went for and winning these scholarships is going to reduce the cost of your education, which bottom line means minimizing your student loan debt. This year, Lila will award a $1,000 FAFSA completion scholarship. Um, and all seniors in Louisiana who have completed their FAFSA can apply. And also a $1,000 Choose Louisiana scholarship if you choose to stay in the state of Louisiana and attend a college here. You can find out the details um, at leela.org or you can shoot me an email and I'll be happy to send you the applications. Now for students or parents who um, are going perhaps to pricier colleges and need some help paying for um, those expenses after accepting all the scholarships, grants, federal and state dollars that you're offered, Lila does administer a nonprofit education loan pro product called Lila Choice, and it's for Louisiana residents only. You can find out more about this at lilachoice.org. And remember, to keep receiving financial aid, you must complete the FAFSA every year that you're in college. So mark your calendars for October 1st of next year so that you can complete your FAFSA for your sophomore year. Ms. Mathurin mentioned that a copy of Leela's FAFSA completion guide for the class of 2022 is posted on the school's website, or you can email me directly and I'll be happy to send a copy over to you. Now, we're here to help you, whether it is 
to be on the line with you as you complete your FAFSA or make a quick phone call into us to um, verify some information, um, or if you just have a question about the process itself, jot down our FAFSA helpline and my email address if you want to start a conversation with me. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, I would also be happy to send it on to you. But I am going to provide uh, Ms. Mathern with a recording of this presentation and also the slide deck. So now is the time to uh, drop your questions into the FAFSA chat box. Or if you'd like to unmute yourself, I would be happy to uh, speak with you directly. And if you haven't already done so, uh, go ahead and um, add the student's name to the FAFSA chat box and Ms. Mathern will know who has attended this evening. All right, I see a message here. Okay, um, this parent is asking about the IRS data retrieval tool. When you get to the section, when you get to the section about the parent financials, you can use the IRS data retrieval tool by providing the parent username and password that you created. That FSA ID that we talked about, you'll use that to link to the IRS. Now, this parent is saying that they manually entered the information. And can they go back into the FAFSA and use the tool? And that is a great question. And I'm going to say, yes, you can definitely do that. So log into the FAFSA, go directly to the parent financial section. You will get to that um, question. Go ahead and say link to the IRS. And then you should be able to um, have your information placed directly into the FAFSA. And the beauty of this is if you use that IRS data retrieval tool, your colleges know that that is the accurate information um, that comes directly from the IRS system. So they're going to skip over verifying you. If you manually enter your income information, they most probably will ask you to go to the IRS website, request a tax transcript to be sent to them. So if you're applying to eight schools, that's eight schools you have to send a tax transcript to. So although it's your choice to use it or not, that is one of the reasons that we encourage you to. It will save you some time. Yes, and this uh, student is asking me to go over again the difference between the parent's financial section and the student's financial section. You'll come to the parent financial section first where the parents are going to be asked to, of course, provide their income from 2020, any other assets that might not be listed on the IRS tax return, um, et cetera, more financial questions. Once the parent finishes that section, it's going to automatically switch over to the student financials. And as I mentioned, it looks just like the parents. So just make sure that you are taking a look at that page to see which sections you're in. We've had situations where the parents entered that they made $220,000 and then they turn around and repeat that in a student section. And um, you know that can affect a student's financial aid offer. So just make sure you're looking at each, each section before you start to complete. Okay, this is a good question. Does using the IRS data retrieval tool cause any issues with their IRS login? Uh, no, it does not. You will not be asked for your IRS login. You will only use that federal student aid ID to pop over to the IRS. That's a good question. Oh, this is great, Ms. Mathern. Thanks for reminding me. What are some reasons a parent might not be able to access the data retrieval tool? 
If you're having trouble using that tool, go back to your FSA ID and make sure that your information is correct in that ID. Then go into the parent, if you're in the parent ID, um, then go in the parent section and make sure whatever was in that ID, the name, the social birth date, email address, mobile phone is exactly what you've put in that parent section of the FAFSA. That's one reason information might not be matched or there's shared information between you and the student. So make sure you're getting all that settled with the IDs and make sure it's reflected exactly the same way in the FAFSA. Another reason could be if the parent files a tax return and uses a post office box. This, I don't know why, but to be able to use this tool, you do have to have a street address printed on your tax return. Another reason might be if your parents file married um, separate returns. If that's the case, there's no one tax return for um, the FAFSA to hit on in the IRS site. So you will have to take both of those parent returns, manually add up the information and place it in the boxes requested. And if you need help, give me a call. I'll be happy to stay on the line with you while you're doing that. Those are a few of the reasons and the most common reasons that a parent or student might have trouble using that tool. If a child had a job in 2020, but didn't make enough to file taxes, should we still include the financial information? Yes, because the student is going to be asked if you filed a return in 2020, there are several options. If the student didn't file a return, he's gonna select not going to file, and that's fine. But the next question will read, did you earn any money from working wages in 2020? That's when you grab that student's W-2 and you manually entered that amount that they made. That's a really good question. So if the children are not working, their income should be zero. That's right. You'll state the student is not gonna file a return for 2020 and they earned zero in working wages. And it's also important um, now that we've, we are talking about this working wages question, Anywhere on the FAFSA where it asks whether it's the student or parents how much they made in 2020 from working wages, that will not include any social security disability or any federal benefits because those are not working wages. This is just what you may have received from an employer. That's right. If the student did not make enough to file a tax return, they'll just state not going to file. And if they did work, they will report that dollar amount in the next field. Oh, this is good. A good question. If I already submitted my FAFSA, can I add more colleges? Absolutely. Go back to FAFSA.gov, log in this time, and select make FAFSA corrections. Jump right into that school selection section and add more colleges. Now, you know how we mentioned um, that you can add up to 10 at a time. Let's say your child added 10 and now they wanna add 10 more or two more. They will remove as many as they need to and if it's all 10, just remove all 10 of the original colleges from that originally submitted FAFSA, add in the new colleges, state their housing plans on those at those colleges, sign and submit the FAFSA again. Okay, and somebody was having trouble using the tool, so I'm glad that Ms. Mathern brought up that question.
let's see, after I complete the FAFSA, where do I go to apply for the TOPS scholarship? Now, I'm not from the TOPS office, but I do know that the, top, uh, that the Louisiana Office of Student Financial Assistance has an agreement. They're the TOPS administrator. They have an agreement with federal student aid to receive a communication every time a student in the state of Louisiana submits the FAFSA. And that communication itself serves as your TOPS application. Now, you know, you do have to complete the other criteria to be able to receive the FAFSA. But all throughout the school year, um, the TOPS group is collecting this data. And when you submit your FAFSA, they can check that off in their system. Does it matter which parent's name we use for the ID? Okay, if we filed as a married couple, or if we're filing as married, do we have to put both names? Let me think about this one. If you've, if you've filed a return and you filed jointly, either one of you can uh, use that create the FSA ID because Either way, that joint return is going to be able to pull, be pulled into the FAFSA, whether it's the parent, the parent one or parent two. Did that answer that question? It, it kind of, I don't want to be vague about it, but no, if you are two parents um, and your child is living in your home, you can select whether you are parent one or parent two and either one of you can create that federal student aid ID. That's right, you do not need to add two FSA, you don't need to create or enter two FSA IDs because the person, let's say parent one is mom, she filed a joint return with dad, she creates an FSA ID, she uses that ID to link to the IRS. All the IRS is looking is, at is for one of those two um, joint filers to be in their system. So either way, whether you're mom or dad, parent one or parent two, uh, you only need that one FSA ID. These really are incredible questions. And there really are no ridiculous questions. So whether you want to ask them tonight or whether you want to call me independently to talk about them, and Ms. Mathern is now an expert as well, so I know that she's happy uh, to talk to you about them as well. Does anybody else have a question at this point? All right, if we don't have any more questions that will conclude our session, but I'm gonna stay on this call um, if the rest of you need to go, or if you don't have a question and you want to talk, or you want to talk to me later and you need to leave our session, that's fine. But I'll stay on um, just to make sure. What income is usually needed to be awarded financial aid? Well, most of the need-based aid is dependent upon um, the lower, you know, it's dependent upon students and parent families who have, um, I'm not sure I want to put it, pretty much 
a lower income group will be awarded the um, need-based aid. However, federal student aid is gonna take into consideration how many people live in the family, how many are gonna be in college. They're just, that's why they ask so many detailed questions because there are so many different situations. So the best thing that you can do is go ahead and submit your FAFSA with the information that you have. Of course, as I mentioned, if you're in a special situation, um, you've had a loss of income since 2020, um, that could also determine and trigger some additional need-based aid. Um, so just go ahead and get your FAFSA done and then work independently with the financial aid office. Um, if you feel like you need some additional assistance. All right, and Ms. Mathern is saying that she is going to post a copy of this presentation on her site as soon as I send that to her. I usually um, edit it the evening before. So Ms. Mathern, I should be able to get this to you sometime tomorrow and I'll provide you with a copy of the slide deck as well. Okay, we're down to just a few um, participants. So any last questions? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close out the session. And please remember to give me a call or email me if you need me while you're working through the process. Thanks again. Thanks to you, Ms. Mathern. Um, and I look forward to hearing from all of you and receiving those scholarship applications. Good night.